Hi, everyone, and welcome to 40 Minutes of Faith. My name is Barbara Cox, and I host this weekly podcast to explore God's Word and our relationship with God. I need a little bit of transition time to go from the real world into God's Word. It helps me to focus. So I offer some meditative music for you to just close your eyes for a moment, unless you're driving or operating equipment. I realize that we can't leave the real world behind entirely, but a short pause might be welcome. Today, I'm going to be taking a look at the most listened to episodes this year so far. I did the same thing at the end of December last year on the first 25 or so episodes that had been released. And I didn't get to talk about all of the most popular episodes because I had excerpts from some of the episodes and then ran out of time. So I still have a few episodes that had been very popular last year, along with some of the newer ones from this year. And we've got another 25 since then. So we'll see how many we get to today. I'm going to just shuffle them up because I printed off some quotes to share with you, as well as including some excerpts of recordings. So here will be a partial listing of the most popular episodes this year so far. In August of 2020, episode number 13 is about the book of Ruth, and that was recorded with Paula, who actually taught me how to run a podcast because I did not know what I was doing. The thought of starting a podcast was frankly terrifying for me. And I thought it was really amazing that after I signed up for this class with Paula, she mentioned, oh, she has a master's from Yale Divinity School. And I thought, that's pretty amazing. What are the odds of that? And I have a quote attributed to Albert Einstein. Coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous. So I think if it's a coincidence, that's God. And then at some point during the podcasting class, Paula mentioned that her favorite book of the Bible is Ruth. Eventually, I worked up the nerve to say, hey, Paula, do you want to record an episode with me about the book of Ruth? And she said, yes. God is trying to reach out to us in whatever way God knows we're going to respond to. So whether that's a burning bush and we notice it and we're like, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. Or it's maybe something a little more subtle. But I feel like God keeps reaching out to the people in the Old Testament and to us now and saying, hey, I see you, I know you, and I want to have a relationship with you. I don't want you to just follow the laws or the rules that I'm laying down. Sure, I'll tell you what it means to be a good, you know, air quotes, good person and to be in relationship and to follow the commandments and the commitment. But I want to see it. Like, I want to feel this relationship with you. And so I feel like Ruth's saying this to Naomi is also this really interesting, nuanced and layered way of saying to the reader, this is what a relationship, a loving relationship with someone looks like. Yes, you get that we're going to all follow kind of the same rules as a society, but you also get this heart level thing that comes out. And that's what I feel like is modeling the way that God hopes we will react to God. Imagine if we said to God, God, don't force me to leave you. God, Mm -hmm. don't make me go home. Where you go, I go. That just blows my mind. Yeah. Goosebumps. One of the most popular episodes has actually been the very first one, not the intro that I recorded on why am I starting a podcast, but the first guest that I interviewed, Melissa. And we talked about fear on June 15th, 2020. Technically, it's episode number two. I think we do hold on to fear. I found that fear is kind of comforting because Mm -hmm. we know it. It's something we can expect. We can expect to be afraid of something. 
and the releasing of it is hard because mm -hmm. when you release it, you're going into another unknown. Living in fear is something that's easy for us to do because it's familiar. We're always afraid of something. We're afraid of success. We're afraid of failure. We fear what's to come. But if we own it, we can move forward. God is always there. The question is, where is our faith mm -hmm. and that fear? Do we turn to God in that time of fear? God didn't create the fear. God did not put that in our lives. It's there. Things happen. And how we react to it is, I think, the biggest difference. In our fear, we can clam up, we can look inside, we can look to earthly things in order to try to quell that fear. Or we can look to God and we can pray about it, we can ask about it, we can look for guidance, we can look to the Bible, we can look to others who are more knowledgeable in our faith journey than we are. God doesn't go away. God is there. But do we acknowledge that and do we do our part in, in turning, in trusting, in putting our faith into action? Episode number 38 was released in March of this year. And I talked with Joanne about what it's like in a Lutheran church that has a praise band, which is something that some Lutheran churches may have, but by and large, most people think about Lutheran churches as having organ music or singing hymns out of a hymnal, and then more non-denominational or mega churches having praise bands. One thing that I noticed and that I really enjoyed, Joanne, is that prayer time during the service that we're talking about right now included very soft and gentle background music. I've never done this before in a podcast episode, but just to show an example of what kind of music might be played in the background during prayers. Now, during the church service, someone usually is talking, but just right now, we wouldn't talk for about 60 seconds. We do have some that we cycle through, mm -hmm. but also I have used some of my own music for all kinds of things during the service. So I'm more than happy to play. I have one called Places to Dream that I wrote right after my dad died. And I have played this one at church. So we invite you to a time of personal prayer. Thank you so much, Joanne. I feel like music is a language and some people listen to it and, and really treasure it. And maybe some people feel like they can speak that language or it goes deep into our bodies. I have this little plaque in my piano studio that says, God gave us music that we might pray without words. So if you would like to learn more about how a small congregation can get a praise band started and what that might look like during the worship service, take a listen to episode number 38 in March of 2021 with Joanne from Massachusetts. All right. In August of last year, in episode number 14, I talked with my friend John about pop culture. And this one includes examples of books and some movies. So 
if you would like to hear a little bit more about our conversation regarding Harry Potter and C.S. Lewis and Star Wars and J.R.R. Tolkien, check out number 14. The environment that I grew up in, C.S. Lewis was worshipped almost. Mm -hmm. And as an adult, as I began to study theology, I began to say, you know, if some of the people I grew up with really read C.S. Lewis, they would not be a fan of him. (laughs) He was very much a believer that in the idea that God does not like set apart a certain people as like the ins and the outs. He talked about this idea that God speaks to people in the language that is best suited for them. Mm-hmm. I think the, the main thing with Narnia, there is both a religious objection to it and a secular objection to it. Okay. There has been controversy in public schools with the Narnia books because there are such strong right. Christian themes in there. And the Christian complaint that I have heard is, and I think you brought this up when we first began to talk about it, is this depiction of Jesus, uh, or Aslan, uh, Freudian right. slip. Yeah. <laughs> you just gave it away. Uh, yeah, I just gave it away. Of Aslan. Yeah, exactly. So Aslan is depicted as this lion. Right. So it's kind of that victorious image. It's not Christ as the lamb, the same lamb that, that John the Baptist pointed to. And yet the interesting thing is that the symbol of Judah, which was the area of Palestine that Jesus is from, and that was his ancestry, is a lion. Mm -hmm. And Lewis was drawing upon that imagery. Part of the genius of what George Lucas did in Star Wars in creating Mm -hmm. the idea, the concept of the force. Mm -hmm. it's, It's a spiritual concept, but it is so simple that people can understand it. And yet you can come from a religious background, whether you're Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, any faith, or you can have no faith at all, but still have a value system. Mm -hmm. And you still see that reality in there. And regarding redemption, that is very much present also, I would say, in Star Wars, where you have this very much a line between good and evil, but also you have this central arc that it is never too late to stop and look at what you have done and realize I was wrong. And with that comes forgiveness and redemption. And there's this beautiful scene in Return of the Jedi, which is the last film in the original trilogy, where Luke Skywalker is fighting his father, Darth Vader, and the Emperor is just cowing them on. And Luke eventually snaps And he viciously attacks his father with the intent of killing him, even cutting off his hand, just as his father had cut off his hand. But then Luke realizes what he has done. And as the emperor is continuing to, you know, paw at him, he throws his lightsaber away and says, never, I will never turn to the dark side. You cannot win. And it's a very similar thing in Harry Potter where there's a in the order of the phoenix where he has taken possession of harry and he's mocking him and saying so weak so powerless and harry responds you're the weak one mm. and you will never know what love or friendship is mm. and i feel sorry for you and how similar is that to the words of luther in a mighty fortress is our god the body they may kill, God's truth abide still, and the kingdom is forever. Yeah. Next up, I have episode number 36 that was aired on February 14th of this year. And that was the first of a two-part series on Islam. I invited my professor from Wartburg Theological Seminary. Her name is Gusum Kukuchari. And we spoke about both her personal experiences as growing up Muslim in different parts of the world, as well as her experiences as a faculty member who has taught intro to Islam to many different students over the years, and her experiences as 
someone trying to explain really cultural similarities among Abrahamic faiths and other cultural aspects such as modesty codes. One topic that is important to me is honoring the rights of women. I learned during this class some perspectives on this theme when it comes to Islam. Gulsum, what are a few examples of why history is important when considering the rights and treatment of women around the world today and not only women who are Muslim? Unfortunately, we only look at our current context to understand what is currently taking place, which cannot really tell us the entire story of a people. In the case of Muslims, they have a story of 1400 years and Muslims are also very diverse even today. And there's around 2 billion Muslims around the world scattered in Africa, Far East, Middle East, like Bosnia or in the Western hemisphere as well. So how can we really put all 1400 years of history and all these people, how can we put all these people into one certain box? And how can we say that this is the story of all Muslims? We can't say that, and we can't say that for any, any people. So the story of the oppressed women in Afghanistan, which is a fact, which is not deniable, but this is not the entire story of Afghanistan. I, I, have, a, I have a very close Afghan friend she is very passionate about you know, bringing change to her country. And we talk about these issues together with her. She wants to talk about what Taliban has done, how he destroyed her country. But on the other hand, she does not like a uh, country to be represented by Taliban. Is it all Afghans are Taliban-like or all Afghan women are oppressed? All Afghans are lazy, you know, they don't want change and this and that. So this is not the story of all Afghan women. So we should be misled if we look at it that way, right? But when we look at the media, this is what we see. The media likes to zoom in and take that picture to us and show it to us repetitively so that we are misled. And then because media actually goes somewhere with that. They have their own agenda and they go somewhere with that and they do it very well. And so I don't know if you're familiar with this famed African author about single story approach. And and what is that? So in our Western dominated uh, Eurocentric media, we have many stories of Americans or the Western people, right? We have good Americans, bad Americans, like serial killer or Savior, like we have all sorts of Americans, yeah. but and sometimes you know even more so towards like good whites, right? Sometimes, yes. But then we look at the third world. She says that we have a single story, like Africa. She says we have that big prejudice against Africa. It's a huge continent, but is it treated like like a village? And the yeah. the common denominator we can summarize like everything about it as poverty. They're poor, right? Yeah. But she, as an African woman, she doesn't like that. So we put all Africans into one box. And sometimes we get so soaked in that. And it almost becomes a racist approach. Mm -hmm. A very recent example. Can we define all Americans with the actions of the recent attackers in the Capitol building? Right, I hope not. Sure. Does that represent all America? Or it is only a part of a bigger story? Right. So I don't want to deny the fact that women, some Muslim women are denied and not given particular rights in places like Iran, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia. But it is definitely because of the political regimes in those countries and their abuse of power and their abuse of religion in those places. And there's a lot of other human rights in those countries. Like we know that a lot of journalists are in prison in yes. countries, all sorts of human rights abuses in those countries. So those places where we see Sharia in place, this is what we see. Oh, this is because of the Sharia that they are suffering from. This is a spoiled version of Sharia. This is a modern version. This is, this is kind of a colonized version of Sharia. It is not what Sharia is about. It has a flexible nature. It is changeable. So this is quite as important to look back at history because mm-hmm. history has different examples so that we can actually have a better appreciation of today. Yes. We have a better comparison. And we should understand that the world has a bigger history than what we have today, right? Mm-hmm. So we can't just judge all Christians no. by looking at modern America. 
right? Yeah. By looking at 15th century. The Crusaders. Uh, yeah, great example. So the same today, Muslim world is suffering from, still suffering from colonization, the trauma of that. They are still suffering from that. So we have to understand the Muslim psyche under the lights of that. Otherwise, we would not understand. It is not to justify the violence that they turn to, but it is to make sense of why this is happening. It's not because they are born violent, because this is very racist, actually. When we actually think of people, oh, they are this way, because this is how they are. Next, I have for you an episode from July of 2020, episode number nine, that was recorded with another faculty member at Warburg Theological Seminary named May Persaud. And we talked about Bible translations. There are basically three different approaches to translation. There's the verbal approach where the translators strive to make the English be exactly following the ancient Greek or the ancient Hebrew. So it's kind of a word for word translation. Now, most versions are not strictly verbal. So the verbal would be on one end of the spectrum. And then in the middle is an approach to translation called dynamic. This seeks to understand what's going on and to reproduce the ancient thoughts and ideas in modern equivalency. So examples of this would be the NRSV, the RSV, the NIV, and the Jerusalem Bible, which was mandated by the Catholic Church. So they're trying to stay with the words, and yet they're trying to not be just tied word for word. They're a little looser. It's dynamic. And then the final kind of translation approach is called paraphrase, where the translators read the the ancient text They think about, you know, what is going on? How can we talk about it? And then in their own language, they just kind of make a paraphrase. And and examples of this would be the Living Bible and the Message. And there are many other examples, too. Do you have a moment, May, to take a look with us at Matthew 6.25? Because I'm someone who worries. And if there's some wisdom to be had about worrying or not worrying. Yes. I have it. <laughs> I have it at hand in the NIV and I know that you'll have some insights into different versions, but Matthew chapter 6 verse 25 says, "Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes?" Well, the interesting thing about this is that the versions are going to agree on this. They all say, do not worry. And this is where May Prasad, when she teaches, wishes that she could get a team together and work on an alternative reading of this. <laughs> so, Great, um, let's hear it. <laughs> yes, the do not wor- worry grammatically can be translated either do not worry or stop worrying. And Jesus is speaking to those who've come and and he's basically saying to them, I I know you're worried, so let's just cut it out to stop worrying. Therefore, I tell you, stop worrying about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. So he's stopping what is already going on in their hearts and minds. And then after verse 25, he talks about the birds and he talks about how the father feeds even the birds and the lilies of the valley. And he goes on don't worry about what you'll eat or what you'll drink. He's addressing the fact that he knows that they've been worrying about these things. And then he says in verse 33, strive first for the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. So the bottom line is to, to lean into God. And then in verse 34, what does Jesus say? The text says, so do not worry about tomorrow. All of the translations agree with that. And that is a possible translation, but there's another possible, and that is, so don't even begin to worry, which implies that the worrying hasn't started. If I were working on this as a new version, I think I would imply Jesus stops the worry of the people who come. He recenters them in God and God's kingdom and what God does, leaning into the fact that God will provide. In this COVID time, God will provide. And then he says, so don't even get started. As if it never was. So don't even get started. I think that that's an important 
way to look at this text. I don't think, do not worry, and do not worry. For me, I like to hear a li little bit more. I like to hear Jesus say, don't even get started. Or to start by saying, stop doing it. <laughs> Next up, and these are not in order because I don't usually have three faculty members in a row recording podcast episodes with me. So you could hear a little bit of shuffling in the background. The next one that I wanted to tell you about though today of the most listened to episodes is with a faculty member named Jay Alanis. It's episode number 16 that aired on September 13th of 2020. And many of these episodes have video on YouTube. So some of the ones that I have mentioned to you up until now don't have a specific video content. It's just the recording that's on YouTube. So I don't need to necessarily send you there for those. But this particular one, I wanted to especially invite you, if you've got time to go to YouTube, I'll put it on the podcast website also, which is 40minutesoffaith.com so that you can get to that link really easily. Jay had created a presentation for us with some maps and some quotes and some artwork which of course you can just listen to it as a regular podcast too. In Sunday school, I thought Jesus was born and then he grew up in Nazareth, but there's something really important that happens between the birth and Nazareth as it relates to our conversation today. And I'm going to read Matthew chapter 2, verse 14. And the New Revised Standard Version says this, Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt. So we've got a visual here for folks on YouTube, an arrow leading from Bethlehem to Egypt, and then other arrows leading out of Egypt and to Nazareth. So keep reading in Matthew and you'll get more of the story. And Jay, you have some parallels to tell us about modern day flights. Yes, indeed. In fact, I have traveled this route several years ago. I traveled to Israel mm -hmm. and I traveled from there to Cairo. So I was able to see firsthand just how intense that desert is. And so I could only imagine the Holy Family having to make that trek across the desert to get to Alexandria. I equate that experience and that uh, physical desert as something similar to the Sonoran Desert in northern Mexico, which is the deadliest desert which migrants cross through to get to the U.S.-Mexico border in Arizona. It's not for nothing that many people, refugees, die in that desert. And books have been written about that. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they die in the, in the heat of the desert, trying to cross into a place of, of refuge. I want to point out from this text is that Matthew relates the story of the Holy Family who flee to Egypt to escape the persecution of Herod. Yes. And like many today, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus become political refugees in the empire of their day. They flee to escape the death squads that Herod ordered against the innocent. And Jesus was the undocumented child of his day and a homeless, displaced migrant. Yes. Like, like his family, many flee the death squads of their native countries and arrive at our southern borders seeking asylum and refuge. And so I asked, church, how shall we receive those who bring Jesus with them? And so I offer the prayer, merciful God, help us to give shelter to the displaced homeless at our borders and to advocate for just and humane treatment of our global neighbors. Jesus' identity is rooted in his culture as a Galilean Jew. He will speak in the dialect of his community. He will learn to speak Aramaic and read the Torah in Hebrew. He will be influenced by the Hellenistic culture of the region, the crossroads between Europe, Asia, and Africa. In the border states of the U.S., we call the spoken language Spanglish or Tex-Mex, a mixture of English and Spanish. And many who travel to our borders bring their accents with them and are identified as foreigner. In time, they will adopt the dialect of the region in their effort to survive in a new country. And so how shall we receive them? Lord, give me your accent of peace and reconciliation with all people, that all might find refuge and sanctuary as my neighbors. And so I like to point out that language is a tool of empowerment. 
and all cultures are defined by their linguistic heritage. And we should not fear languages we do not understand, but hear them as an opportunity to learn about the worldview of others who come here. In other words, language in today's world is politicized and, yes. used, and used against people who have a different accent than our own. And no one in, on earth is accentless. We all come from a certain place. We all have an accent and we are all people of God. And so language should be used as, as, as a gift and not as a tool uh, to oppress others. Next, I have for you a podcast episode that I recorded with my friend Anita from Massachusetts about prayer shawls. This is number 31, released on January 9th of 2021. So this is another episode where I would encourage you, if you've got time, watch it on YouTube. And if not, just listen to it. I'll have all of that on the podcast website for you so that you can see some examples of the different prayer shawls that this particular church ministry has created. We pray over the shawls. We meet once a month here at Grace the King. So people bring their work and we put our work in the middle of us and we all put our hands on it and pray over the shawls that we're working on. Sometimes people know who the shawl is for. And if you know who the shawl is for, it is easier mm -hmm. to pray for that person. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you pray with your pattern. How Say does that work? A repeat of three stitches. You could pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Or you could put a Bible verse to your pattern. So it depends. Sometimes you know who you're making the shawl for, and sometimes you do not. So shawls don't have to be knitted or crocheted. They can be sewn. They can be fleece that is tied. I mean, you can make your shawl in any number of ways. They can be small. They can be big. They can be very small that they just fit in somebody's pocket. Say that the person doesn't want to wear a shawl all the time, but they'd like something in their pocket to remind them. That's so amazing. I love that. I had never heard that before. Yes, they're called pocket shawls, and there mm -hmm. are patterns for pocket shawls. Shawls can come in any shape or size. This one happens to be a triangle, and it can be worn like the one I have with like a collar, or it can be worn over the shoulder. So there's lots of ways to wear a shawl and lots of shapes. This one would be for a new baby. Mm -hmm. And it would be great for a baptismal shawl because it's white. Sometimes we use the churchier colors for the shawls. I have a different two-part episode to let you know about. And that is on November 24th of 2020. In episode number 15, that's part two of an episode series that I recorded with Jennifer about racism and adoption. I think one angle of fear is white people are afraid if they admit they have biases or have done racist things, they're admitting that they're a horrible person. Hmm. So it's easier to just completely deny the entire topic and just push it away and shame anybody who is talking about it. In fact, one of the ways this fear manifests is by saying, well, if you would just stop talking about it, it would go away. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, someone with cancer or mental illness or a broken bone you don't just stop talking about it right. to make it go yeah. away. You have to actually address it. I wonder if that's and, another situation um, of privilege. In my privilege, I can yeah. ignore it and my life won't be too badly affected, yeah. but then I'm ignoring the people who are very yeah. much affected by it. And so the fear comes from admitting that we may have done something wrong, thought something wrong, mm -hmm. or we might be wrong. And honestly, that's not what this whole journey is about. Yeah. This whole journey is about recognizing 
that all people were created in the image of God and not all people are treated as such. So I think that's one fear. And then I don't know exactly which population of people has this fear, but a lot of people fear that they're going to have to share their wealth or, or yeah, like give up half of their belongings so that other people can have their stuff. And Mm -hmm. um, I think that's been a prevalent message. And I think that if you look at scripture, (laughs) we're called to give up everything. What does Jesus say to the rich man? That's right. (laughs) What did he say to the rich man? Here's what happened in the book of Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 to 22 from the message version. A man stopped Jesus and asked, teacher, what good things must I do to get eternal life? Jesus said, why do you question me about what's good? God is the one who is good. If you want to enter the life of God, just do what he tells you. The man asked, what in particular? Jesus said, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as you do yourself. The young man said, I've done all that, what's left? If you want to give it all you've got, Jesus replied, Go sell your possessions, give everything to the poor. All your wealth will then be in heaven. Then come follow me. This was the last thing the young man expected to hear. And so crestfallen, he walked away. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and he couldn't bear to let it go. Yeah. So I think we have a fear of loss. Sure. And I have read from some black individuals who speak to the matter white people have a fear of a loss of their status in this culture. Mm -hmm. And what that tells me is that white people do know that there's a privilege to being white. Mm -hmm. So we have the privilege of pretending we don't have a privilege. I wanted to let you know about another popular episode that was recorded in January of 2021. And that is episode number 32 about preparing to go on a pilgrimage to Israel with my friend, Lindsay. And the reason that we recorded this in addition to another episode with my friend, Teresa, about actually being in Israel is because it was a very meaningful process to actually prepare for this particular pilgrimage. At the time of the trip, I was co-facilitating The Rock, The Road, and The Rabbi by Kathy Lee Gifford and Rabbi Jason Sobel. It really was an amazing study. I just felt like it opened my eyes to a part of the Bible that I didn't even know before, like an onion that kept revealing another layer and stories that I've heard a hundred times were jumping off the page at me when viewed through a different lens, like the Jewish lens. I could see it completely differently than I had before. And that was really eye-opening and amazing to me. Being in Israel was like history coming to life. I am sitting on the Mount of Beatitudes after having just gone sailing on the Sea of Galilee. It was a beautiful and amazing experience. I feel Jesus in this place and it is so peaceful. Through the Beatitudes, Jesus is telling us a better place and way to live. Which set of rules are governing my life? The world's or God's? Mm -hmm. What are you worrying about? Let go and know that he is God.
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us, deliver us, deliver us. Thine is the kingdom, thine is the power.